Hello everyone, I'm Greg Cohen from the International Centre for Neuromorphic Systems here at Western Sydney University. And I'm talking to you today from one of our astrocyte containers, one of our mobile neuromorphic telescope observatories. I'll tell you a little bit more about that and the other neuromorphic applications that we're looking at here at Western Sydney University. And there's quite a range of them. So we're going to talk a lot about space tracking and what we use this container for. But we're also going to talk about other applications, including some of the robotic games we're building, robotic foosball and robotic pinball. And I'm going to explain to you why these are so important in really using and showcasing how neuromorphic hardware and changing the way you do the sensing can lead to systems that, can't, that can do things that conventional systems and cameras simply can't do. And I'm going to show you how by picking applications and figuring out the exact tasks you want to do, you can build visual processing systems that get closer to the robustness, the reliability and the power efficiency of biological systems. So that fits in kind of well with our mission at the International Centre for Neuromorphic Systems, which is really driven by applications, and applications looking to solve real-world problems. So this container, for example, we use to track satellites in space and to look out and track space travel. That's a real-world problem. I'll explain in a moment why that's such a pressing concern. But having a clearly defined application really goes right down to the sensor level. So we look at sensors here, we look at algorithms, and we look at neuromorphic processing and how to bring them all together in a way that we specialize for the applications at hand. So to that point, one of the things that we're using them for is space situational awareness, tracking objects in space. And to give you a little bit of context on that, I need to introduce a concept called space situational awareness or space domain awareness, as it's more often called these days. And essentially, that's got to do with tracking objects in orbit around the Earth, usually between us and the Moon and in lunar orbits too, where, which is where this field is moving towards. But essentially, the reason this field exists is that we've been launching objects into space for 60 years now, and we've really done very little to clean up after ourselves. So we put lots of active satellites up, but we also have a whole bunch of old satellites still floating around up there, not to mention tons and tons of space junk. These are bits of rockets, old derelict satellites, things that are broken off, other satellites, for example, that are all in orbit around Earth and pose a serious risk of collision with other satellites and anything else we put up, including, and very importantly, crewed spaceflight. So given that we're launching satellites at an ever-increasing rate, this risk of collision increases with every satellite we put up. And we do a very bad job of tracking and figuring out where these objects are in orbit around Earth. Now, being able to track them and figure out where they are is the first step into solving this problem. We can't go and clean them up until we know exactly how bad the problem is and where all these objects are. We also can't start policing and legislating the use of space until we know how bad the problem is and to figure out whether people are doing what we ask them to and the rules that we may put in place in the future. So we need to do a better job of tracking these objects and that's where neuromorphic cameras can help. So just to give you a little bit of a rundown of what you're looking at in the orbits around Earth, I'm going to use some terms, and I'm going to explain them quickly now. The first one would be LEO, low Earth orbit, and that's that cluster of satellites you see just around the Earth, that very, very dense cloud. Those satellites are pretty low to the Earth. In this sort of band of LEO satellites, you'll find all the CubeSats that we launch. You'll find the mega constellations that are going up, like Starlink, for example. You'll also find the International Space Station there and the Hubble Telescope. This is a very accessible part of space, very close to Earth, not hard to get to, and still protected by quite a bit of the atmosphere. It's also quite a hotly contested and very busy part of space as well. Now, if you go right out to the outer edge, you'll see this ring of satellites. That's the geo belt, the geostationary belt, the geosynchronous belt. Now, these satellites are really interesting because the period of their orbit around the Earth exactly matches the rotation of the Earth, which means if you put a satellite in geostationary orbit in that ring of satellites you see at the outer rim of this image, they'll stay above the same point in the Earth because they'll rotate with the Earth as the Earth rotates. And that makes them fantastic for communication satellites. That's why you don't have to move your satellite, uh, your, t your satellite TV receiver because the satellite is pointed at is always in the same place. However, this is a very contested part of space. It's busy and most of our really, really critical space infrastructure is up there. If you think about how we depend on space for every, almost every aspect of modern life, you realize how important this problem is to solve. So these neuro, these geosynchronous satellites are also really far away, 32,700 kilometers or more. 
and they look pretty dim to us, so they're hard to track. But I'm going to show you again how neuromorphic, satellite, neuromorphic cameras can be used to track all these objects. In between those two bands, the LEOs around the Earth and the ring of geosynchronous satellites, there are a whole bunch of other satellites in the Middle Earth or Medium Earth orbit. These include GPS satellites, things that have longer periods as they go around. There's a bunch of these other ones, more eclectic and more interesting orbits. So every part of space is important. But these three are the ones, Neo, Leo, and Geo, are the ones I'll talk about most. So let's go right into what we're doing. So I like to show this because this is really the first setup we use to look at uh, stars with a neuromorphic camera. And in fact, that telescope set up on the right with the three telescopes is very much the same as what you'll find in the compartment behind you with our telescopes. Now, what I like to show with this is that left pane where you see the two telescopes. And the reason I like to show this one is that at that bottom blue telescope, you actually see at the back there an old neuromorphic ATIS camera. This is a really, one of the first prototypes of these cameras. That one I assembled myself, you can even see the screws hanging out of it. But I want you to contrast it to the sensor in that red telescope above it. On the back of there is that big black box, that's the Finger Lakes instrument, FLI sensor, the CCD, it's actively cooked. It's a beautiful astronomy camera, about $60,000 worth of camera there. And that's one of the gold standard types of cameras you use in astronomy and to some degree space situation awareness. Now, the reason I like to show this is that the neuromorphic camera at the bottom there already offers us benefits. And let's just do things you can't do with that camera on the top there. And that was with the prototypes we had five or six years ago. And the reason is the way neuromorphic cameras work. It's got to do with the fact that we don't get frames often, but we get events when we see changes in log illumination. And if you think about looking at the sky, right, especially at night, not a lot is changing. So the frame-based camera still has to pull a frame out and you have to process all these empty pixels. Whereas with the neuromorphic camera, you only see things that are moving. Now, the great thing about space is that everything is always moving. So that makes them really, really good for observing things like satellites move into the field of view without having this enormous amount of data which means, of course, that we have less processing to do, less storage that we require, and less information to transmit. That's actually really important here on Earth when we want to look through telescopes, but even more important when we put these cameras in space. So this is where we were maybe five or six years ago, using some telescopes provided to us by the Department of Defense here in Australia, out in Adelaide. We've been busy since then, and let me show you what we have now. These are our astrocyte companions. In fact, I'm in one of them right now. And these are mobile containerized telescope observatories built around neuromorphic cameras and enabled entirely by the way these neuromorphic cameras work. And the reason we can do this is because unlike a conventional camera, we can tolerate motion and we can actually image whilst we move the telescope. Now that lets us do things you can't do with a normal camera, but as well, we don't need to go and stabilize the telescope like most astronomy cameras need to be stabilized. So whereas for a normal camera, you want to build an observatory and put the telescope on as much stable platform as you can get, we don't actually need that. In fact, motion is good for us, and we can use the motion to our advantage. And as a result of that, we can build them into these sort of shipping containers, these unstable platforms that we can move about as we like. And the great thing about shipping containers is there's a whole industry around moving these to wherever you want. So we can put it on a truck, ship it somewhere, put it down, just needs power, the roof slides off, a lifting platform lifts the telescope up, and we can start doing space tracking right away. So this is enabled by the fact that we've changed the small sense in the back of those telescopes. And this is a real world space tracking capability that we've developed here. And it all started literally as a sketch of my boarding pass. I literally had this idea and I found someone who said, show me something. We're very excited about your neuromorphic technology that you're showing us here, but how would you wow us with this? What are you gonna do to say, this is something you need to pay attention to? And I said, I'll build something, I'll build this. And we went from this sketch to this. This is the actual first astrocyte container at the Avalon Airshow in about three months. This rapid prototyping phase really showed us that by looking at the application and doing what it takes to solve that, right, by working with the sensor itself and not with the existing way you do telescope infrastructure, it allowed us to break all the rules. And in fact, it was easy because we didn't actually have a clue how to do this the conventional way. And we came up with a system that a conventional astronomer may never have built. But we've shown that it works and it works well in situations where conventional cameras fail. This is what it looks like inside Astrocyte 1. We've now moved on to our second Astrocyte, as you can see. We've made it more efficient in small spot. But 
it works even better. And we've just had to refine only small things, like add it in bulk storage and apply it in the mechanism. But we really got the concept right the first time. And we've only really iterated in a small way since. So I should also say the astrocytes, the ones we're in now, you know, research is a team effort and a team sport. And I couldn't have done it with all these people you see here. It takes a lot of people to keep these things working and a lot of people to get the research to the point that it is. I also want to just thank our funders. Air Force Plan Jericho were the guys who actually were crazy enough to allow us to build the first one of these. The Australian Air Force picked it up and allowed us to build more of them. And all of this couldn't have started without the Australian DST group who provided us with the initial telescopes and the access and the expertise to get this whole project off the ground. They were the ones who really said, let's see what happens. I'm going to show you what the data looks like from these cameras. This was actually the first recording I took from the neuromorphic camera. This is a star, this, sorry, this is Mars actually, from a telescope. And you can see it's bouncing up and down a little bit. That's because we're really excited that we've got it in focus and jumping up and down into the telescope. But you might also notice this is the circular oscillation to it. That's atmospheric distortion. And that's actually led us to a whole field of research into adaptive optics and the application of these cameras in adaptive optic systems for telescopes. But this is really where it all started. It's the first thing we ever saw. And now later that night, we'll just point it around in front of the sky, and this is the data from it. And you'll see through the field of view we came this object here, the Shiok Guru. We had no idea what that was. And to be honest, uh, we had a lot of lively debate about what it could be. It turns out it was low-earth orbit satellite. And that was really the aha moment for this data, I mean, for this project, when we realized, hold on, we're seeing something interesting in a whole different way to the way you normally see these sort of objects. So that's where we were five years ago. Let me show you how far we've come. That was a single planet and a satellite. This is what we're looking at now. This is going to the 4070 UC cluster of stars. And you can see how many stars you can now see with the latest generation of cameras. This is a Gen 4 camera from Prophecy, by the way. And what you'll notice as well is in a second, I'm going to move the telescope slightly. And you'll see when I move, even more stars pop up. And that's really the importance of using the motion to see better. So we've come a long way. I'll show you some of the other things we can do and see with neuromorphic cameras and telescopes. So this is actually tracking a low Earth orbit satellite. So this is a rocket buddy coming through the air, through space, I should say, and we're following it with the telescope. So we're moving the telescope to keep it in the field of view. On the left, you can see the frame-based output if you render this as a frame, but on the right, you can see a special temporal pattern with the time as the vertical axis. And these are stars shooting through, you see here. So what I'd like to use this to show is that if you look at the frames from this camera, if you make frames out of the data, it really doesn't do justice to what's going on inside. And you can see those streams of events from the objects really tell you a lot about the objects themselves. Right? And we can actually tell all sorts of things with the later cameras in terms of how they're tumbling and perhaps even work out some characteristics of the materials on them. So the data itself from the event-based camera is so much more richer than the frames that you can generate from the data. By the same token, this is what it looks like from a conventional camera. This is the CCD taking picture of the same satellite. And what you'll notice, all the stars are streaked because you're integrating, and they're moving as you're integrating. And that slightly brighter streak on the left-hand side, that is the satellite. And you get an exposure every four seconds because that's how long it takes to expose and transfer the data back. Honestly, I think our representation is a bit more interesting. So that's low Earth orbit satellites. Let's look at geosynchronous satellites. They're slightly different. By the same token, a geosynchronous satellite isn't moving relative to Earth. So if you want to take a photo of it, you point at the satellite, you do a long exposure, all the stars move as the Earth rotates, that's where your long streets for the stars, but the satellite itself is a duck. And that's what you get. This is how we look at geosynchronous satellites with conventional integrated cameras. With event-based cameras, we can look at them. And keep in mind, these are really far away and really dim. And this is what we see. So here are the stars moving through the field of view. And on the right hand side, you can actually see this one constant duck, and that's the uh, geosynchronous satellite. That's an object 32,700 kilometers away reflecting right back at us. And we can also focus on that and follow that and have the stars, sorry, can follow the stars and have that move as the Earth rotates as well. And that lets us do all sorts of things like accurately position these things and take very small and very finite moves as they move through the sky. Just to give you an idea of uh, what it looks like when we raise the telescope. This is us pushing the telescope up and you can see Jupiter on the top right hand side there. And this is what Jupiter looks like on an event-based camera. And I just like to show this as a contrast because in the left panel you see frames, this is from a Davis sensor. In the middle you can see the event-based output. And what you'll notice is as we move the telescope up and down, Jupiter moves up and down the field of view. In the frames we get blurring and we get motion blur. 
and in the events we get this nice constant motion. I'm going to show you and demonstrate to you why we can do this with a new Morpheus camera and why we can build these containers. So I recorded this a few weeks ago now. If you are an astronomer, I'd look away. This is what you absolutely shouldn't do around a telescope, just for the record. So as you can see there, even though the job I haven't done, we get blurring on the frames, but the event camera does a great job of just tracking the object continuously. And that's why we can build these shipping containers where the ground may not be so stable and we have cars driving on the highway nearby. Just as a bit of fun, we can look at very bright things. This is the International Space Station coming through. We're looking at it with a, a Gen 4 sensor here. And you can actually see structure from it. And this is without doing any post processing. So I think if we really look into how to extract the structure from this thing, we'll be able to see more than just the sort of rough outline of the structure here. But we're tracking this as it moves to the field of view as the stars come through. Uh, this is just another little interesting video. This is tracking a low Earth orbit satellite from the telescope behind me during a really windy day. And I was actually operating the telescope remotely from South Africa at the time. So I couldn't tell how windy it was. And you can see the satellite drift in. And now notice how it's wobbling up and down. This is the wind. And you'll see the stars in the background are moving almost like an oscilloscope because the whole telescope is moving backwards and forwards. But what we realized from this is that we can still do the task we want to do. We can see the satellite as clear as day there. And we can see the star field moving in a consistent way. And in fact, what we've shown is that we can track through all of that. And we can still do, maybe we degrade performance a little bit, but in conditions that you would never dream of operating an integrating sensor, the web based camera still works pretty well. And just to finally bring it all together to show you some of the things we can do with the data, this is just a nice plot of uh, the neuromorphic sensor in the top left. In that red circle is the satellite we're tracking. And then looking at the stars as they move through the field of view, we can build this beautiful star map you see crawling across the screen over there. And we can use that data to figure out a bunch of things. We can figure out exactly where we're looking at the sky from that star map using astrometry. But if you look at those two inserts there, you can see we can actually figure out where the satellite is and where the star field are relative to one another. And we can do this not just through constant velocity, but we can actually have variable acceleration, even go to higher order movements like uh, non-uniform jerks. So we can actually shift, move the telescope suddenly and still continue to create the star field through that. This is sort of where we brought it all together into one piece. So I'm going to leave this based off there and we'll talk about something completely different. I'm going to talk about my robotic foosball and robotic pinball projects. Now the reason we're doing this is honestly to build better benchmarking systems for neuromorphic engineering. And this is a really important task because ultimately I think we have a lot of trouble as a field conveying to non-neuromorphic uh, engineers how our systems work and the benefits and the performance benefits we get from our systems. And the reason is because we're comparing to conventional metrics built for conventional sensors. So let's take a look at data sets. I'd just like to show these two examples because nothing does a better job of sort of introducing data sets than the data set everyone knows, which is MNIST. M -NIST, M -NIST, and MNIST is a great data set for a bunch of reasons. Firstly, it's easy to understand. You look at it and you know exactly what the task is. It doesn't take anyone very long to figure out what MNIST is all about. It's relatively small, it's easy to manage, it's not gigabytes and gigabytes of data. It's also the sanity check. If you're building any learning system, you can run on an MNIST and you know what to expect. It's a really, really good way of just making sure that your system makes sense. And if you don't get more, less than 95% accuracy, sorry, if you don't get more than 95% accuracy, you know there's something wrong on how your network is built. So obviously the neuromorphic community did a very smart thing, which was to start converting these data sets into neuromorphic forms. I was working on one called NMNIST, but there's MNIST DVS and a few other attempts like that, which are all really good. They're really definitely the next logical step. And they're great in validating ideas and systems, but they carry with them this legacy of conventional processing. I think there's a danger to that, because again, those tasks are well-defined for the frame-based environment in which they were generated. And there are some issues with doing this. For example, we have to project them on a screen and put them as a camera. And there have been some controversies about whether that's a good idea or not. And we tried to address some of those. For example, we use an e-ink screen where we can now control the lighting as well because it's just entirely reflective. And that's produced some interesting results as well. And even that doesn't really go towards showing casing the benefits of neuromorphic sensing. So one of the things we built, for example, is our plane dropping data set. And this is a bit close to what we want in that we chose this task specifically to show off the high-speed nature of the camera. 
When you drop planes freehand in front of a camera, you don't have much time to do the whole task of classification. But then again, still, this is still a classically defined problem where everything is pre-recorded and you can't be dynamic. You can't react to what you're seeing and change what you're going to do next because everything has to be pre-recorded. So that's what we came to this idea of robotic foosball. And it all started because we like to play foosball at the Telluride Neuromorphic Engineering Conference. And one night, after I think a long day at the workshop, someone said, hey, we should build a robotic foosball table. And you know, we sort of said, yeah, why not? And eventually, we did. So this is it in my lab here in uh, Sydney. On the left, you can see the robotic foosball table. And you can see how it works. It's essentially the one side of the table is all rigged up with actuators so they can spin the players and move them back and forth. We originally built this thing to cost less than $150 in terms of the actual equipment. That's why it's made of string and very inexpensive motors. But we also built it in order to ship it over to Telluride and reassemble it there. So it's one feat to build a robotic foosball table. And it's another feat entirely to build one you can ship across the world twice and still have it work. And that's a testament to my technical team here in, uh, in Sydney. So we built this table. And I just want to show you this quick video, something called a snake shot. I really find this illustrative because watch this. This is a legal move of foosball and just watch how the ball just disappears. Now this is interesting to me because if you actually look at the frames, and this is courtesy of Alex and all that, what you'll notice is that if you're doing it at 30 frames a second, right, the yellow uh, labels there show you the time elapsed since that first frame. And the last three, you can see the kick happen, right? 33 milliseconds after that has happened, the ball is gone, which is a bit of an orange blur if you're still really close to it. And 60 milliseconds after that, it's completely out of the field of view. You cannot track that ball with a frame-based camera. And this is the limitation. You could use a faster camera, but now you've got more data to process. And then you're going to be slower. And you can't get around the tyranny of time in games like this. This is what the data looks like from a neuromorphic app. And this is an interesting problem because we all say how easy it is to track objects with neuromorphic cameras. I mean, this is what it's built for, right? And it does work really well when everything is stationary, except you can still see that the iron bars running across the table are reflecting light. And when my hand goes into the field of view, that causes all sorts of effects. Now imagine if this table is being shaken by a bunch of kids and people sticking their hands in there. We're really good at tracking the ball. How do algorithms stack up? And the answer is not great. And the real reason is because pattern matching doesn't work well in this task, right? Here's a, so some uh, recordings of the actual game playing. And what you'll notice on the right-hand side there is I've selected five images from that. Of those five images, only the top three, uh, sorry, the top three aren't actually balls at all. They're the players. So if you do simple template matching or pattern matching, it doesn't work. And deep learning falls into this pit quite a bit. We have built some really good deep learning trackers. But we find two problems with them. They're either not fast enough because there's still latency. And this is not a problem where batching data can help. If you put 100 frames into the uh, into your, your deep learning network here, you don't care about like, nine of them. You barely care about where the ball is, let alone where it was. What you care about is where it's going to be. So that's when neuromorphic engineering really helps. And the way these cameras work gives us a benefit in saying, you know, we can respond much, much quicker. This is just a little bit of an example of what the table looks like in action. And you can see it's not great, but it plays surprisingly well, just based on the neuromorphic camera. Uh, there's a lot of room to improve and build on it and high level strategies that we're keen to implement. And this is a great task, but what essentially we discovered with robotic foosball is that, you know, it's engaging, it's fun, it's, everyone likes it, but it's really hard to say, how do you know if something's doing well in foosball? How do you know if you're doing a good job? I mean, you can qualitatively say by watching, you know, oh, it's hard to beat, but you know, can we put a number to that? So it is that's the idea of robotic pinball. And pinball's great. Two buttons and really simple input, right? And it has a score. And the score is so important because if I build a pinball playing system and you build a pinball playing system, if yours consistently gets a higher score than mine, no one can argue that yours is not the better algorithm. Right? There's a quantitative metric that no one can disagree with. And you can then change that. You can say, well, what about taking the score and dividing by power consumption to get some idea of pinball playing efficiency as a function of power, right? Once you have this fixed number, you can start building all the metrics you want off that. And what really makes this interesting as a game is that pinball is a bit of a brutal game in terms of time. If you're not fast enough, you lose. The table doesn't wait for you. If the ball's rolling towards you and you can't make a decision in time, you can't get the answer out of your system, you lose. 
is the tyranny of time embodied in a very simple sum. We also can control every aspect of the table so we can add more distractors, make the task as simple or as complicated as we want. And it's actually quite hypnotic to watch the thing hitting the ball. So one of the things we can do, for example, is just using a very simple two ne neural network of these cameras, you can start seeing the benefits of you know, a cluttered background, for example. But this table with a very, very, very simple two neuron system, essentially two receptor fields, it can quite happily keep three balls in play far longer than a human player can as well. So we really like this as a challenge task to say, you know, this is something where we would love people to bring their own ideas and algorithms and play it against it. And you can bring conventional cameras, you can bring anything you want, but here's a playing field where you can showcase how your algorithm works and compare it to others. So I think that's probably a good point to end it. Thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to talk to you guys today. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to take them. Thank you so much and have a great day.